So I wanna go ahead and demystify this right now, that if you're a developer who's never really worked in the database world, when you hear something like NoSQL, it, it immediately feels intimidating, right? You're like, wait a minute, I'm not a DBA. I don't know the ins and outs of SQL or anything like that. Let, let's pause right there and just demystify NoSQL. This doesn't mean no SQL. It's really not only SQL. And Cosmos DB, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful offerings that there are when it comes to needing to store persisted data. Think about this for a second. You have a front end where users interact with your website, your web form. Uh, they enter data. They click the submit button. Then what happens? Well, then that gets sent to some sort of a back end. If we're reusing knowledge that we've acquired so far in this journey, it may be hitting something like API management, which then may be hitting something like a function app. But then what happens? There's a missing piece of the puzzle here. Nine times out of 10, whenever we're actually collecting data on the front end, we need to store that data somewhere. And this is the part where it starts to get tricky because we start to transition into what happens next, what goes past the function app into the data storage area. And there's about 50 different ways that you can store data in the cloud. And it's not as simple uh, of a solution as it used to be. What did we used to do in the good old fashioned days? Well, in the good old fashioned days, we either stored data in a uh, file, I'm gonna go ahead and put like just, oh, I, I, I hit way too many buttons here. We, we, we either store data in a file, there we go, fix the pin, a file, this could be a text file or a CSV, or we stored it in a relational database. This would be something like SQL Server or MySQL or Postgres. Postgres is super popular these days. But as the times evolved, okay, bear with me for a second. As the times evolved, APIs evolved. We started to move away from SOAP-based or RPC-based APIs that heavily relied on XML towards something like REST-based APIs that relied heavily on JavaScript object notation. And the assumption is at this point in your journey, we, we said this in the very first set of videos that you watched in this playlist, that if you're jumping into AZ204, our hope is that you have at least one or two years of software development experience in this point, and you know JSON. You, you know how to work with JSON objects at this point. So what started to happen and what started to evolve was wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to take a JSON object using something like my function app and transform this into some type of SQL payload or CSV file? What if I could just store the raw JSON in a database like this? I'll just put a database over here. What if I could just store the raw JSON in this database and, and importantly, query the database parsing out specific records based on my criteria. I could parse out details like specific JSON documents and specific JSON keys, keys within each document. This is what Cosmos DB brings to the table. Cosmos DB will store your JSON documents. That's typically why it's called a document DB or a document database. And this brings up a good time to talk about the Cosmos DB uh, uh, account model or object model. That's what I should say. Whenever we set this up, whenever we go into the portal right here and we click on, you know, new Cosmos DB to set it up, what it does is it creates a Cosmos DB account, an account. This will actually get you an HTTPS endpoint, colon, whack, whack, your account name, dot, something like cosmos.azure.com. And it serves just like an API, where we'll be able to perform interactions within our Cosmos environment by hitting that HTTPS endpoint. But it gets cooler than that. We're going to talk about the architecture of it in just a second. Within a Cosmos DB account, we can then create separate databases. You can really create as many databases as you want. And you should think about these databases as, you know, like any other database that you've ever needed to store. We might have a sales 
database. We might have an HR database. Nothing too earth shattering at this point. What comes next is where we start to pivot away from what we're used to seeing in the relational database model. You think about inside of a relational database, if you're ever familiar working with a basic SQL database like Postgres or something like that, what comes inside of a database? Well, typically what comes inside of a database are tables, and then inside the tables, you have records. It's a similar logic, but not quite the same here. Within the databases, we have what are known as collections, like so, collections. And like I say, they're similar to tables in the sense that a collection is usually focused in on storing like data of the same topic. For instance, in my sales table, I might have a collection for storing customer details. And then I might have a separate collection for storing, you know, sales offices or places where we actually perform sales operations. Then within the collection comes the actual records themselves, and these are known as the items. This is the nomenclature for all of these things. And you can think about these items as a single .json file, a JSON document. So I want you to drill this into your memory right now. This is the hierarchy of working with Cosmos DB. Whenever you're deploying your stuff, you have to create an account. Then you create a database. Then you create collections. And then within those collections, you can start writing new JSON records into the collection itself. Now, where Cosmos DB really, in my opinion, defeats the competitors is right here. When it comes time, when we've written data into, we've got items now in the collections, one of the things that makes it feel more like a database than anything else is the fact that we can use raw SQL, SQL, the structured query language, to query our items, which are JavaScript. This feels like a fuzzy concept at first, because one of the things about the structured query language was the S, the structure. The thing that makes relational databases relational is the fact that every table adheres to very strict schemas. It has to have this many columns, and the records or the data that we write into the tables have to adhere to those column rules. This is completely different in the JSON world because the records can have as many details as we want. It's known as schema agnostic. Cosmos DB is schema agnostic, or at least for NoSQL, it's schema agnostic. This is a huge, huge win for developers on two fronts. The first front is there's really no transformation that needs to take place between the application tier and the backend data store tier. If I have a JSON payload in my function app, I can just punt that straight over to Cosmos DB to store it and persist it. The second reason why this is such a huge win is I can iterate on my application, my whole application. For instance, let's say I've been collecting sales data for a year. And then a year goes into it and we're like, you know what would be nice? If we also collected this additional data that comes with part of the sales. Well, all we have to do is just shove that into any new JSON payload that we want to write to the database. We can just add or remove keys and values at whim when it comes to using a NoSQL database. There are two constraints and only two constraints that you need to know about when it comes to working with this and understanding a schema. We have to have an ID field. This uniquely identifies each record each record. And then secondly, we have to have a partition key. This is a new term, in the at least in the NoSQL world. You won't really see this too often in the relational database world. What does this really mean? In order to make Cosmos DB so insanely fast, and I'm talking the single digit millisecond responses, what they do is they group like data together on the same physical disk space. So 
So follow me on this journey for just a half a second. Let's say on the same physical disk space in the same data center, they set up four different partitions to store my data. Those will be four different disk subsystems. And I'm storing sales data. So I'll have a sales ID to uniquely identify each one of my records. But then I'll also have something like a customer ID to help me group sales records together based on the customer that bought them. For instance, let's say I have customer ID 123. Customer 123 is a repeat visitor. So they're going to have lots of sales records, but there's only one customer ID 123. When we say I want my partition key to be the customer ID, that's going to group all of my customer ID 123 records in the same partition. That way, behind the scenes, when I send in a query, hey, I need all the sales from customer ID 123, Cosmos DB can very quickly identify where that record is and pull out the specific records from the specific disk subsystems. Now, yes, there's redundancy, there's resiliency, there's very little uh, risk of data loss when it comes to working with Cosmos DB. This is all about performance tuning the backend database to return to you single digit millisecond responses. But wait, there's more. The whole thing about Cosmos DB is it is a globally distributed database. What does that mean? What's that all about? Well, quite frankly, the cool thing about storing JSON documents is they're very, very small, usually in payload size, and they're very easy to load quickly into a database and query into a database. So let's say I have a user that's in Japan and they are interacting with my app, which then has to write to Cosmos TV. We're going to do a little planet right there because it's kind of like the Cosmos TV symbol. What may actually happen is our application will determine that the nearest Cosmos TV endpoint that it should work with is in Asia. But then what happens is Cosmos DB, because it's globally in nature, it will then replicate any record changes around the world to other Cosmos DB instances. So if my analytics reports run in the East US, after a certain amount of time has elapsed, and it's usually very quick, we're going to talk about that in just a second, then the records will be able to be uh, written very quickly in Asia and then replicated to the rest of the world where, you know, other analytics platforms or whatever can happen from there. It's also worth pointing out one other incredible feature for the data engineers who are working in the analytics space. Azure Synapse, which is the data warehouse solution, natively integrates with Cosmos DB and can model the data directly in Cosmos DB. Put another way, there is no ETL. There is no reason to extract, transform, or load data from your Cosmos DB into Synapse because Synapse natively integrates with Cosmos DB and can model your data right there. That's pretty cool. That's really cool. Gotta admit. Now, one of the big things that you need to understand about Cosmos DB is right here when it comes to replication. This is known as consistency levels. And basically, you get a scale for determining how synchronous or asynchronous this replication can be. If a user in Japan writes data to the Asia database, there is, if it's a inconsistent level, there is a period of time where the data does not exist in the East US or Europe or wherever because we're waiting for the records to be replicated. But at least right here for that Asia instance, the data is solidified in place. Now, if we have an application where this level of inconsistency between our database tier or our replicated database is not acceptable, we can force a consistent level upon it. Meaning data cannot be solidified in the home database until it's also been solidified in the remote databases. I keep hitting the button here. There we go. So you do have the ability to set the consistency levels 
on your own. Now, I know this is this has been a journey already up till this point where we're learning a lot about Cosmos DB. But the big takeaways that I want you to understand is, first of all, it's really working with JSON documents. That's why it's oftentimes called a document database. We can use SQL, the SQL structured query language, to query our JSON documents. You'll see that in action in this set of videos. It is schema agnostic, meaning we can change the payload that we want to store in the database at any time. But it does have to have two items, an identifier for each record and a partition key. It is globally distributed, meaning we, by default, Cosmos DB exists everywhere around the world. And your application can hook into your Cosmos DB account that's closest to its running location. And we control, as part of that, the consistency levels. Now, I did say there was a slightly different variation of Cosmos DB that is relatively new. Postgres has now come up with the ability to be a distributed database. And Cosmos DB can now run on top of a distributed Postgres instance. So if your application already works with Postgres, you can simply point it to your Cosmos DB account that you set up for Postgres, and everything else will continue to work exactly the way it does. If you're already writing with Postgres libraries, great. Keep writing with them. Use the exact same Postgres libraries that you've always sent it to, but instead send it to your Cosmos DB account. And now you have a distributed relational database for that particular workload. It would make a migration to a distributed relational database a dream to work with Cosmos DB. That being said, Cosmos DB's primary use case for the longest time has been NoSQL document databases. But I would be completely remiss to tell with if I didn't tell you that there is now an option to use a back-end relational data store that is globally distributed and it's just using your Cosmos DB account. So this has been understanding Cosmos DB. In the next few videos, you're gonna see it in action. Get ready, because it's gonna be some big stuff. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.